welcome to Southeast London. I am uh, just near Greenwich, uh, where they where they invented time. And uh, yeah, I'm I'm doing well. I I like to be at home, so I'm very happy in this new world. And uh, but uh, obviously, uh, I hope that uh, we can restart the business world as well. Well, um, yeah, we were so close to the lockdown that we were really trying to decide very, very late if we were going to try and still run it or if we were going to try and uh, do something else. And in the end, we only made our decision, I think it was 10 or 11 days before the start of the event. And normally the event is about 2,000, 2,500 people. Uh, this is the Barcelona event. so. Um, we uh, made a had to had to move very very fast, um, but you know work up until that point had been a little bit depressing because every day somebody else would drop out, somebody would have a travel ban, somebody would tell us they can't make it. At the same time, the the UK government advice was very confusing because they were trying to encourage people to carry on doing these kind of things to keep the economy moving and this kind of stuff. Um, in the end, by the time that we ran the event, it was obvious that it could not um, have happened normally. But uh, in the run-up, it was a bit tricky. And yeah, we had a scrambling time, but it was a very positive experience because our entire team, even though commercially we, we made the event free, so commercially our, uh, uh, we had no interest anymore, but we could really pull together and align and create something positive. And in the end, I think people enjoyed what we did, not just because of what we did, but just the fact that we tried, you know? Yeah. My, my, my line that I repeated many times was, um, make sure we don't isolate despite our self-isolation. So the aim was, of course, to try and keep the ideas flowing. So it was a positive experience. Well, my main advice is don't do it so quickly. So make the decision early. <laughs> Hopefully no one's still in that boat. Um, my main advice would be um, focus on the value that you bring. I think that people get worried about the technology, about whether, you know, people will turn up, about whether, you know, if you focus on the value that you provide and if you genuinely do provide value, <clears throat> then nobody cares about whether you've got the nicest camera angle or whether you're, 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 uh, you know, you're wearing the, the, the suit and tie. People care about um, keeping us moving, finding new ideas. Uh, and I think you also need to take away the traditional, I mean, we, we only made the decision just before, so we had to stick to some traditional aspects of a conference. You know, we still had sponsors, so we made a virtual exhibition. Um, we still had many, many, we'd already recruited many speakers, so we had to try and uh, deliver the sessions that we'd already promised people. But for anybody else with time, don't use the constraints of what a normal event would be. I mean, we at least changed our event from a two-day, seven-track event into a five-day, one-track event, right. because you can just keep it going all week. I mean, it's exhausting for you as an organizer, but, but the audience can just dip in and out. Uh, at their convenience. No one's going to sit there all day long anyway. People have lives, so don't expect them to sit there all day long. So, um, so yeah, be willing to change some of the constraints. Um, at the same time, have a go if you're providing real value. If your event doesn't provide real value, may as well cancel it because you're just going to be adding to noise. And I'm pretty sure that very soon we're going to be very tired of virtual events and, you know, Zoom fatigue. Uh, so, you know, these, I think we're going to see a huge influx of every training company, every conference company, every, every, every person with any kind of personality attempting to try and do some kind of Zoom or, or Teams or whatever event. So I'm worried about uh, people being sparing with their, uh, with their audience. And so be surgical, provide value, definitely. Uh, the main takeaways, I would say, from an industry and the digital, I mean, obviously, every digital, digital transformation plan has been accelerated. Mm. That's obvious. Uh, 
I have to admit to being a little bit disappointed by the industry, certainly when I was doing my interviews for this event. Re to be fair, it was relatively new, the lockdown, but I was disappointed that so many people were focused 100% on virtualizing the existing business rather than considering the new business model which could exist. And to be fair, again, a certain amount of continuity business as normal is required. There's going to be a lot of confusion. Probably stability is key, but very, very few people even thinking about how we can take advantage of the new world, how this can, you know, where is the silver lining on this cloud? What are the new business models which can, can, can work? You know, uh, what are the advantages of digital that traditional do not have? And this is why I often say pharma is still stuck on web 1.0. You remember web, web 1.0, it's basically where you try to make your physical brochure into a website brochure, and actually there was very little value. When web 2.0 came in, which allowed you know, user generation, where it allowed you know, a much, much more um, interactive version of the internet, we can see how the web 2.0 companies now dominate and all of the web 1.0 companies are no longer in existence. So pharma has an opportunity here, perhaps a once in a lifetime opportunity, and it requires a little bit of breathing room, which I realize is very hard to find. But I do think that the people who don't find that breathing room are going to have a much harder time six, 12, 18 months from now. So it's necessary. Well, we've never had that kind of abyss. We've never had the, 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 the digital camera in pharma. We've always been able to carry on as normal. We've always been able to remain profitable just by increasing our prices. Uh, even though we all know that Google, Amazon, Apple are going to take slices from our business, it almost feels like they're gonna, we're going to let them eat parts of us <laughs> uh, without complaining. And yes, I realize we tried to partner with some of these companies, but we're still in the experimental stage and we need to move beyond the experimental stage now. Well, I think the phrase new normal must be the most common phrase being used at the moment in the world, uh, i.e. we're not going to go back to exactly how we were before. But I think that what people need to realize is they have a say in what that new normal looks like. They don't have to just be passive. So there are really obvious ones like the uh, digitization of medical meetings and how what has been a fiercely traditional process in the past, you know, actually flying across to the other side of the world, actually listening to uh, lectures all day long and probably only taking 5% of that information back home, if we're honest can vastly change. You know, why is there not a Netflix of medical meetings yet? I know a couple of companies have tried it, but the medical meeting organizers themselves were not very willing to play game because of course they earn money from the admission fees of these events. Now there's a new opportunity to make this happen. So, you know, where is the organization that is stepping up to really own a medical you know, information area in one disease? That, but to me, that's, you know, I hadn't even thought of that until I started talking to you just now. That's, it, it's just very obvious to me. Um, where is the greater use of artificial intelligence to take advantage of the greater data flows that are going to come from all of the virtual presenting and meetings that we're actually going to uh, have? You know, why are we not employing the next best uh, action type technology more universally given that things will be more gradual. So, you know, I think that in every department of a pharma company, there is a, uh, a 1.0 way of digitizing and a 2.0 way of digitizing. And I think actually there are many, many examples of this already in existence, maybe not within pharma. So we don't even have to be very original. Mm. We can find what works elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, People think that your interaction, I mean, interactions in total have actually gone down. Yeah. So just digitizing is clearly not going to be enough. Yeah. People fear that 
this means you're going to have less impact. I mean, you probably bank with an app rather than visiting the branch every time now. Do you have less interactions with your bank? Is the service reduced with your bank? Do you have no idea what your bank is doing anymore? Actually, the opposite is true in so many cases. I probably have more interactions with my bank now. So yeah, you just need to break out of, a, a, of the mindset change that of course so many of us have fall into. And uh, you know, telehealth is here to stay. Uh, panic is the first piece of advice. <laughs> I laugh, but actually, if you think that the world is going to stay normal, then you're probably doing something wrong. So panicking is the first stage and it's a necessary stage, um, you know, followed by, you know, the, the almost the mourning for, for what, what was the uh, old business. But hopefully after that, there is an enlightenment and uh, a realization that actually there is an opportunity here. I think I, you know, I'm, I genuinely believe, and I'm currently writing a, an article and I'm not sure if I can publish it yet, but the title of my proposed article is COVID, the greatest gift for humanity, mm. which might feel like the exact opposite of, of the news uh, cycle. But I do genuinely believe that um, this has been a perfect disease in that it, it obviously has caused huge deaths, but not so many that we have been unable to continue as a society. It's not, you know, killed our thinking. We're still able to connect with each other. This is the first time in history that we've had a pandemic, which actually allows us to reset, press the reset button on so many things. Yeah. So I think there are many, many reasons to be positive as a result of this situation and to actually emerge stronger. It won't happen this year. But a few years from now, we could almost be looking back and saying, thank God we did press the reset button. Just as forest fires are very destructive, but actually they are a natural part of the renewal of a forest. You sometimes need to clear out some of that dead wood uh, and, and, and uh, thrive for the longer term with a new normal. Uh, the first thing I think of is, of course, the Apple-Google collaboration, um, which is actually rejected here in the UK. They're trying to do their own version of it. Yeah. I realize everyone is worried about privacy and giving your data to Apple and Google. I think that at the moment we are in an emergency and privacy is a luxury. I know that sounds very uh, kind of cavalier, but I think we have to recognize that we are being a little bit selfish by putting our own privacy above the common need of everybody, which will only come when we cure this disease. And it's not quite so important here in our countries in, in Western Europe, but I think when we hit the developing world where smartphones are ubiquitous, but social distancing is extremely hard, something like this kind of technology could have a huge difference to the prevalence of the disease and could save you know thousands millions even of lives so um i'm not sure if i really answered your question as you expected uh because i think this technology as i say will be really useful outside of places where we're actually already flattening the curve uh but i think it's really important apart from that I have to say I haven't really seen very much um, that I can think of that, um, and certainly nothing that I'm using beyond the usual Zoom and Netflix and all the other streaming services that we rely on.